you know, keep calm and keep on whatever, you know, keep calm, Batman's on the way, whatever, you know. Um, but as I was thinking about the message last week and, and, and what I was going to be dealing about God being faithful, I came across a line, I, I typed in and said, well, God is faithful. And I saw someone did this, they said, keep calm because God is faithful. And I used that as our title slide last week, more of the title of the message was it deal with the faithfulness of God and how he dealt with King Hezekiah. And because of King Hezekiah's obedience to God and his faithfulness to God, how God showed up and was extremely faithful in the life of Hezekiah. That when, if you remember, when the circumstances seemed like there was certain defeat coming to Hezekiah, because Hezekiah kept his trust in the Lord, God miraculously showed up and defeated an army that should have easily smashed Jerusalem. But because this king, King Shennacherib, came in and began to think more of himself than we should, and that should be a lesson to us also, when we begin to think more of us than we should, then all of a sudden God will come in and humble us. And God literally turned this king away, did not allow him to even shoot one single arrow against Jerusalem, but turned him around, sent him home, and allowed two of his sons to kill him in the, the temple of his own God when he was there to worship his false god. And that was something that God said he was going to do through the prophet Isaiah. So God declared his faithfulness. And today, I want to encourage you again, keep calm. No matter what may be going on in your life, no matter what situation may be arising, keep calm because God is faithful. Never forget that. God is faithful. And the verse I want to use to open up the message this morning is found in John chapter 16. I, I alluded to this a little bit last week. I, I said a little bit about it. But I'm going to, we're going to look a little bit about it today because this is the new. You know, all the things we've been talking about the past couple weeks is Old Testament. I'm going to get to the New Testament today. Now be calm because God is faithful. John chapter 16 verse 33 says this. Jesus is talking. He says, I have told you, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. In other words, God says, and even Jesus is saying here, you don't have to be stupid and blindly in what you in your walk of following me. Because even here Jesus says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. So what? So you can be what? You can be calm. Too many times we allow the situations of life to just literally run roughshod all over our life and just cause so much havoc and so much confusion if we would just literally just step back Take a deep breath and realize that if we are a child of God, we can have peace through Christ. Why? Because this is what Jesus himself just declared, right? Did, did he do did not say? I have told you all this so that, so that you may have peace where? In me. And here's what he says. He says, here, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. And, and, and you know, I always like to, to talk about this. This, this chapter here is, is a, a discussion. It's a series of talks. It's a conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples the night before he's going to be crucified. I mean, what a way to bolster the troops. It'd be like telling guys going out there and fighting war. Guys, many of you are going to die today. But don't worry about it. It's for a good cause. What a way to bolster the troops. He says, in the world you're going to have many trials and sorrows. Oh boy. I want to be a follower of him. Because when you, when you think of that, because think about it. Who here wants trials and sorrows? Raise your hand. If you do, I'm going to come down and smack you silly because you're a liar. I grab a psalm book and throw it at you, never mind my story, which I won't tell right now. <laughs> but you won't have any trials and sorrows, but here's what it says. Again, I love it when God throws but in there. Because when, when God uses the word but, that means the circumstances are getting ready to change. He says, but take heart, because I have overcome. The world. You've heard me say this many times about this verse. Because he overcame, what does that mean? We too will be overcomers as long as we keep our faith and our trust in him. Like I said, this is what Hezekiah found out 
in his life. Hezekiah, if you remember last week, he, he was doing everything he knew that, that the law said he was supposed to do. He was a guy who followed God after his own heart. He, he pursued God with everything that was in him. And Hezekiah, he finally, he drew a line in the sand. And many times you hear people tell you to do what? You need to take a stand. You need to get to a point where you do what? Where you draw the line in the sand. But is drawing the line in the sand enough? See, that's what Hezekiah did. He drew a line in the sand and said, I'm not going any further. This is what's going to happen. This is the stand I'm going to take. Then all of a sudden, then the enemy showed up at the door with great force. See, many times we think it's a big enough step that we take a bold enough stand by just drawing the line in the sand. Here's to know what happens after you draw that line in the sand determines whether or not you will be victorious in the decision you made or not. What you do once the circumstances arise because they draw the line and say, I'm taking a stand. But how do you know when you begin to take a stand, there's going to be an opposition to that stand. Yes. So we saw Hezekiah did that, and then again, he took the stand, the opposition came, and God was very victorious for him, and God caused a great victory there. But this week, I want to look at a guy by the name of Paul. Have you ever heard of a guy named Paul? Paul's a guy, he wrote, he's the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Uh, he, he, went on very, he went on many, many missionary trips. He planted and established many churches. And he won many people to Jesus Christ. How many of y'all like to have a resume like Paul? You know? If we're a Christian man, we would say, man, what Paul did, I would love to be able to, to do what Paul did. See, often we believe that if we're following God, being obedient to His Word and doing what we're supposed to do, that life will be smooth sailing. But I'm here to tell you that is not always the case. It rarely is the case that it is smooth sailing. So, I'm going to use Paul as an example to, to show this to you today. Because since Paul did all of this stuff, surely, surely, since he was such a good guy for God, since he was the head cheerleader on the Jesus squad, Everything, everybody had to love it. Every, everything had to be going smooth. Right? But surely, surely, since, since he was God's biggest cheerleader, things were going to go easy for Paul. It'll be behind you, but if you have your Bibles, you want to follow When well, you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start into verse 21 and read to verse 28. And I'm going to read what Paul says here. He says, But whatever they dare to boast about, I am talking like a fool again. I dare to boast about it too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I know this, I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Now listen to what he begins to say. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the, from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities and in the deserts and on the seas. I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered, shivered in the cold, without enough clothing to keep me warm. 
Then, besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Now, here's a man. I, I, I gave you his resume at the beginning, but here's a continuation of his resume. You, you begin to think, well, you know, God, you know, why? Why in the world would a guy who's given his life to you like this, why would all of this stuff come upon him? Why would he, I mean, again, how many want to be pulled out? We like his resume, but the first part, you know, two-thirds, you know, write the new thirds, two-thirds of the New Testament, planted and established many churches, won many people to the Lord, because as I, as, I, as I said so many times, that's the what? That's the flashy stuff. That's the stuff that people, that's the stuff that people think that, that's important. Oh, look, look, look at all what, see, see, this, this problem, look at all what I have done. But even though Paul, through God's help, did all these things, in spite of all that, all of these other things happened to him. The, the Jerusalem, you know, he, he, by the Jews alone, he was whipped five times in 39 lashes. How many of y'all want that? How many of y'all know that the, those whips weren't the type of whips we're thinking of today? He was beaten with rods three times. Ship, how many of y'all? Who in here has ever been on a cruise? Okay. How about, you know, when, when you're at port and you see the ship there at port, how does it look? It looks big, doesn't it? You're sitting there at port, you're looking at it, you see this cruise ship you're going to get on, you go, man, that's a big boat. Then all of a sudden, after a little while, it sets out and it gets out to the ocean. And if by some chance, if you have to, what I noticed how small our ship was, of course, if you look back and see all the water around, you realize how tiny your ship is. We, we, we got a chance to do an excursion to where they, 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 they hooked up a little like portable dock there next to the, the ship, got on a boat, and they ferried us to the, the private island of the, of the cruise ship company. And we're there, and I look out, and, and here's all this water, and then you know, the, the ship's not as close as it was at dock. And I look out and I go, man, that ship looks awful small. <laughs> but all of a sudden I realize, you know, even though that ship may look big at port, when it's out in God's creation, it's really not that big of a deal. So how many of y'all would like to, you go on a cruise and three times you're shipwrecked? <laughs> how many of y'all would go on a cruise again? <laughs> yeah, right, Steve. But all this stuff that, that Paul was going through, he was, this all happened simply because he was serving God. Simply because he was taking the stand. Because he drew his line in the sand. All of this stuff came upon him. And when, when we read the stuff he went through, see, we like, we like to hear about the two-thirds. We like to hear about the establishing churches. We like to hear about going on the missions trips. But yet, through all of that, Paul also endured all of this. All of this happened while he was... All these things, but you're saying, well, Pastor, what are you trying to tell us? I'm telling you, be calm. Don't worry about it. You know, what was it, Bob Marley? You should have a song. Don't worry. Be happy. No. Even though he didn't really know in his song to tell you how to truly think, he may try to do things. He didn't know what true happiness was. If I'm not mistaken, did he commit suicide? No, he didn't. Now somebody else did. Uh, but you know, but said, don't worry, be happy. And then they don't really know what uh, happiness is. True happiness, true joy is found where it's found in the Lord. And that's why Jesus can say, can say, take heart, be calm, have peace. Why? Because I'm faithful. Because God is faithful. Through all of this, God has shown that He was faithful. Because He, the same man who went through all of this stuff, the same man who who performed all these things. This is what he wrote in Romans 8, 28. This is, this is one of my life verses. I quote this verse many times. If you've talked to me any amount of time, I've probably told this verse to you, let alone, I don't know how many times I've said it from the pulpit. But I said in Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You know, when you, when you think about it, you figure, Paul's got to be nuts. How in the world can he say this? When he went through all the stuff that he's went through, because he found it to be true. He found that no matter what danger he faced, no matter what he went through, God somehow, some way, 
was able to bring glory not to Paul's life. Even though Paul was known as one of the greatest apostles ever, he was only that way because he kept his faith in Jesus Christ. We only really hear about Paul, we only hear about these great men of God because they didn't give up. When the times got tough, they just kept on pressing on. They didn't go, oh me, oh my, why is this all happening to me? Because Paul had this, he had this, this understanding of God. He says, I, we know that all that God calls us everything to work together. Everything to work together for the good of those who love God. See, that's the key. To those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. So no matter what's going on in your life, if you keep your eyes upon the Lord, He will turn it around for your good. He'll bring honor and glory to His name. And that's what it's all about anyway. It's about taking glory off of who and from who? From us and shining it on Jesus Christ. Now again, talking about Paul, if, if this, you know, what we read in this one chapter here about Paul wasn't enough, here's what he tells us in chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. He says, this, this boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was called up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I want to boast, I would, I, would be no, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anybody to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. In other words, it's all about, he's saying, what, you know, been all this stuff that's happened, even though I've planted the churches and I've written all of these epistles, it's not about that. It's about you hearing, seeing my testimony, and hearing my message, which is what? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Him being the Savior of the world. He says, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, now listen to what he says. And this is the attitude he already has here, but listen to what he says. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from being proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Now again, here's a man who, who prays. He was a man of prayer. He was a man who knew many times that God would answer his prayer. In fact, in one of the nights before they were shipwrecked, he was on his way to Rome. He said, an angel of the Lord, and who I'm serving, he, said, he was praying, an angel of the Lord of God stood before him and told him, Paul, don't worry about it. I'm going to save you and everyone on the ship. And he gave him instructions how to make sure that even though the ship was going to be marooned on an island, that everyone would be safe. Even though the ship itself was going to be destroyed, everyone would be safe. So Paul knows that God answers prayer. Because Paul was in a, in a dangerous predicament and God delivered him greatly. So surely when Paul would sit there and say, God, you know, take this thing from me. Take this affliction. Take this thorn. He says, I understand why you're giving it to me. Will you please take it away? Surely God would listen to him, right? He's a great man of God. I would dare to say there's probably none of us in here that have pursued Jesus as wholeheartedly as Paul. Because how many of you have written inspired words from God? I know God's come upon us, and I don't mean that to sound the way it sounds, because I know when the Holy Ghost moves and He comes upon us, we begin to speak in interpretation, begin to interpret the stuff. That is God doing most. We're speaking words of God, and I understand that. But Paul talks about how he's done that too. Many, many times. But it's not a lot of it. But yet Paul, here, here's this man of God. And, he, and all the things that he's done, and he said, you know, I've, three times, three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. But he said, surely God would listen to his prayer. But something we need to understand. Sometimes the best answer from God is no. 
We don't want to hear that, do we? But sometimes the best answer from God is no. Because I, I, I've shared this many times. I'm going to share it again today. We only see the right now. We only know what's happening right now. And we only know, what, we only know certain things by our limited knowledge and understanding. It is God who sees everything. It is God who sees the complete picture. And Charlie and I were talking about that a little bit last week. God sees it all. God's the one who if you truly trust Him, He will orchestrate things and He will bring things to pass. Not necessarily the way that we want them to happen. I'm here to tell you because again, we don't like the thing that Jesus said. In the world you're going to have many trials and sorrows. But He does say, He says, but take heart. But take heart. I have overcome the world. He says, I'm giving you peace. You can take heart in this because I'm the one that's in control. We need to understand that if we are truly children of God, that God does have our best interest at heart. And no matter what is going on, we can take comfort. We can take peace. We can be calm. Because God is faithful. He's never failed us. He never will. Because He cannot fail. He is the Almighty God. He cannot fail. God always knows what's best. And, we, and it's, sometimes we, we just need to, we need to get to a point where we, we have, we, we settle that in our hearts and our minds, that whatever God decides is okay. As long as it's His decision. Whether it's yes, no, or wait. But being humans, we, we, we don't like some of those answers. But we need to get to a place where we truly trust God and rely upon Him. Because here's what he says in verses 9 through 10 of 2 Corinthians 12. He says, each time, he said so, he prayed about it once. And the first time, God said, my grace is all you need. I'm going to continue here in a second. Second time he prayed, God says, my grace is all you need. He prayed a third time. And God said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weaknesses. In other words, in the flaws of your life, in the weaknesses of your life, God's power works best is where, where you can't be confident, where in other words, you can't take credit for it. You can't begin to, you can't begin to think more of yourself than you should. He said, my power works best in weakness. He says, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in insults, hardships, persecutions, troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, we've got to get to a place that no matter what is going on, we're trying to point our life to bring honor and glory and praise to Jesus Christ. No matter if we're battling with depression, no matter if we're battling with an illness, no matter if we're battling, battling with a financial situation, no matter what it is, we need to say, God, how can you somehow in some way bring honor and glory and praise to your name? If we would only get to that point in our life to where God, I don't care what happens, as long as you receive the glory and honor, I'm here to tell you that's when God can show up and begin to do a work in your life that you would never be able to understand or comprehend. Because here's this great man of God begging God to deliver this from him. And each time God simply says, No, my grace is sufficient, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul, after the third time, finally got the idea. And he said, okay, Lord, that's fine. Then all of a sudden, I'm going to give you, as, as that song says, I will praise you in the storm. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to exalt you. That even though the waters may be, may be rising up, the wind may be blowing fiercely, even though it seems like the ship is getting ready to go down, Lord, even if it does go down, what would it jump say? Lord, even if I die, yet will I praise you. See, it's about getting our eyes. And then, look, look, look. Let me say this. If you get offended by this, fine, but get over it. 
It's about getting your eyes off of your little insignificant life, off the little insignificant story of your life, and let your life become a part of the story of His life. Become, be, 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 be glad that you were invited to become a part of the story that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That if we draw all men on to Him, if we lift Him up, He'll draw all men on to Him. And we can bring honor and glory and praise Him. That's what it's about. Exchanging our little insignificant life and taking on a story that is so much greater, that, that is so much more worthy, that has so much more to offer than anything we could ever have if we receive everything this world has to offer. It will fill in comparison to being part of the story of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to get to that place. We need to get to the place where we stop complaining about our situation. Stop complaining. See, there, there, there's nothing wrong about praying about things. But, there, but there's a difference between praying about things and complaining about things. Huge difference. We get to a place where we stop complaining. And we get to, to pray and we say, God, you know. As Paul said, that's why I'm going to take pleasure, Lord, in my weaknesses. In insults and in hardships and persecutions and troubles. See, because here, you know, we need to understand. Doesn't the Bible say this? Did God say this in the Bible about his children that we are the apple of his eye? That he loves us dearly? And that truly if someone messes with us, who are they ultimately messing with? They're messing with him. We don't, we don't necessarily have to tell him about it. Don't you think he takes notice of it? You know, if he truly knows everything, if someone's sitting there and you go, don't you think our Father up in heaven sees that? Do you think we have to say, God, you see what they're doing to me? <laughs> You see what they said about me? Shut up! <laughs> Give God all glory and praise when people come against you because you're a child of God. Yeah. Give, him, give Him glory because you were counted worthy and suffered shame for His name's sake. Realize that when you're weak, then you're truly strong. Because it's not you who's doing it. It's Him. It's Him who's showing up. It's Him, it's him the one who's taking you down this road. See, He was praising God in spite of the situation and circumstances. And because of it, God's power and glory remained even more fully known through His life. And I'm going to close with this portion of Scripture here. But before I read that portion of Scripture, I want to encourage you to trust the Lord and understand that He is faithful no matter what may be going on in your life. I don't care what's, what's happening. God is faithful. You can be calm because God is faithful. As with Paul, God will bring you through even the hardest circumstances. But what you need to do is just trust Him. And that a lot of times is the hardest thing for us to do. So, so to, close, to close this message out, I'm going to Close it out with a portion of scripture that a little while ago I read many, many times, but I think if it's so fitting what we're talking about today. Because again, this is Paul who wrote this. Before Paul wrote this, that's what he wrote. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and the call according to his purpose. Now here's we already read his resume and what he went through. And here's what he says in Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Where are musicians come? Does it mean that He no longer loves us? Now listen. Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Does it mean God no longer loves us if these things are happening in our lives? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Let me say this. It's a
state of mind and attitude of heart that we need to get to and realize that our life is not our own. That if He decides for us to live, great. If He decides for us to die, great. And that's not an easy place to get to. But again, it's at a place where you get to where you realize that God, He knows best. And as long as it's God, it's okay with you. Doesn't mean He no longer loves us if all this stuff is happening. Verse 37 says, No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Church, I'm here to tell you, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going through, overwhelming victory is yours as long as you keep your eyes upon Him. Because the overwhelming victory could be in this life, whether He performs a great miracle to deliver you from the situation. But the greatest miracle of all is when we one day will stand before Him and see Him face to face where He says, where he says Well done! Well done! Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. To any way you look at it, overwhelming victory is ours. And that's what you need to grab a hold of. Believe me, I want God to answer the prayer. Me personally, I want God to answer the prayer in this lifetime. I'm just being honest. If I had my choice, that would be my choice. But as I said, God sees the big picture. But overwhelming victory, he says, no overwhelming victory is ours. But there's a place you need to get to, and this is what it is to talk about in verses 38 and 39. And the first part of verse 38 holds the key to it. It says, we need to get to this point. And I am convinced. We need to get to a point where we are convinced, where we are sure, where we are sure that God is in control, that God loves us, that nothing can ever separate us from God, no matter what we're going through. It cannot drive us away from Him. It cannot separate us from Him. It cannot separate us from His love. Because He says, "For and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing, can you say that? Indeed, nothing, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate you? Nothing, nothing in all creation. And when you realize when we talk about all creation, that is everything that God has spoken into existence. In the very, the very ends of His realm and everything He's created. Nothing in all creation. Satan himself is not strong enough. All the legions of hell themselves are not strong enough. All the depression, all the worry. None of that is strong enough.
first time thought it could satisfy. But I really want you to think about what that song says. Who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth can comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful than true? And then it says, I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. And that there is a fountain. Who is the king? Victorious warrior. And he's Lord of everything. He's my rock, my shelter. And here's the great, my very own. Blessed Redeemer who reigns upon the throne. And I'm going to use this song as our altar call this morning. And if the Lord has been speaking to you throughout this message, and we begin to sing this song, slip out from where you are and say, Lord, who can satisfy me? Who can satisfy me? Who can satisfy my life like you? Lord, I give. I give myself to you. Just begin to worship him and praise him and seek his face. Say, Lord, allow me to trust you like never before. Lord, as the, as the title of this message is called, Lord, allow me to be calm. To be calm. And keep calm. Because you are faithful. Let that be your heart's cry this morning. Let's sing this to him now. Let's sing. Who can satisfy my soul? Bye. 